at some other ways of dealing with things not going well, you know, and yeah. how we respond to that. Um, well, one of the questions I was going to ask you actually relates, and we can bring it right back to that part, is yeah. when you were saying that with all of the, you know, all of the praise letters you got, the one that stuck in your mind was a letter about your hair. Yeah. Why is it? that the majority of people can get 50 people saying they're amazing and that one person that has an issue with it, we tend to focus on that. Why, why is that? You know, I think there's something cultural about that. You know, I mean, how many parents will go into their kid's room, the kids just spent a half hour cleaning and putting things away and what do the parents typically notice? And I'm sure you've had this with your own kids. The one thing that's laying in the middle of the floor or <laughs> that isn't closed right, completely. Yeah. You know, I, I yeah. don't know if it's like biological, if we're programmed to find the flaw. Um, and if we grow up with a lot of criticism and a lot of negative feedback, um, it's very easy to identify with the one negative opinion as our whole presentation, as our whole essence, as our whole being. And you know, there's there's some bigger pieces than what's going to help us get over that than just looking in the mirror saying, I could do anything. I am an amazing, wonderful child of light. You know, um, we need a little bit more than affirmation. Sometimes we need bigger help than that. Sometimes we need, you know, it's like if there's crap in the basement, go clean it out because that's going to keep us stuck. And that fuels this self-belief that I'm bad. And I started mentioning when I turned 50, I don't know if it was a combination of some of the personal work that I was doing, um, some of the spiritual work that I was doing, or just absolute exhaustion, but I just didn't care. And I think age gives us a little bit of perspective that, you know, that we don't have when we're 30 or 20, or maybe even for some of us 40. I know people who are so comfortable in their skin at 18 that somebody can say, you know, you're ugly. And they go, yeah, I know, and change the subject. And it, it, it just doesn't stick anywhere. But if you've got a core belief system that doesn't quite affirm full worth and worthiness, then anything that challenges the veneer or the picture that we create can get to that core very easily. So that, that's why that, you know, that work, rejection doesn't mean you're a bad person. It may just mean this idea isn't ready to come out to the light yet. I've had some ideas that may sit in a drawer for 15 years before it's time to talk to them. And other ideas I go back to and it's like, oh, this is kind of a crappy idea. Let's go on. Um, a couple ways to talk to ourselves, the vocabulary. You know, I've, I've walked out of experiences where I felt like the presentation just didn't land right. Or, you know, sometimes there's other stuff going on. It's not, it's often not personal. I was doing a presentation one time and didn't find out. It's like, why are they not laughing at my jokes? Why are they not, you know, why am I getting absolutely no affect from this audience? And I found out afterwards that the teachers had gone in. This was like the day before the kids were coming. Um, the teachers had gone in thinking that they were going to have the day to spend in their classroom getting ready for the kids and were told to report to the auditorium to hear me speak. So there was no buy I mean, they were angry about that, and understandably so. There was no buy-in. There was no anything. And if, you know, they weren't going to show this administrator that they were enjoying this. Yeah, so their what what's happened in their lives has directly affected your presentation. You would only hope that they would get the information they wanted to get out of it, right? I show up, I, you know, here, and this is another 12 step thing, you know, you show up, you do what's in front of you and you leave the rest to something that's bigger than you. And this has been one of the hardest lessons I've had to learn is that I have to be willing to work without immediate validation. I, I think about my dentist, you know, when she fills somebody's to teeth, you know, she has evidence when my husband was doing construction work early, early, early when we first started our business, you know. We'd go around town and he would say, oh, you know, I hung that ceiling, you know, or I, I you know, put up that, you know, I, I, I built this, whatever we were looking at, you know. He had evidence. He, he had something he could look at. When you're a writer, when you're a teacher, when you're a presenter, when you're, a, you know, um, 
doing the kind of work that I'm doing, I don't have a lot of concrete evidence. When I'm working with kids in the classroom, even day after day, a lot of the work that I do as a parent, you do this work on faith. Yes. We have to teach things more than once. And then sometimes you see a little glimmer that says, oh, he did get it. And he may not have gotten it from me. He maybe heard this from his second grade teacher, and it finally showed up in my class in fifth grade. I don't know. I don't need to, though. That's not my business. That's God or spirit or whatever, something bigger than I am. You leave the results up to if you bring your highest level of integrity and accuracy and clarity. This is me talking about me. If I bring my highest level of integrity, accuracy, and clarity to the words that I say and the words that I write and the work that I do, the results are not up to me. And I know, Dan, that in many cases, I'm just one less time somebody has to hear something. They're not going to get it from me. But maybe I'm breaking up the soil so the next person who throws the seed down, the seed will sprout there. And that yep. maybe it'll happen in another lifetime. I don't know. I don't get to know. And I don't need to know. You're delivering what you can, the information that you know you have, that you know is going to help in some way, shape, or form in the best ability you can. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then it's like from there. Yeah. And if it doesn't work out, you know, I go out to my car and I look in the mirror and go, didn't go the way I wanted. What am I going to do different next time? That's yep. the key. Correct. Do I take this feedback as a way to beat myself up? Or do I take this feedback simply as information saying, maybe I need a little disclaimer here. Or maybe we need a break earlier in the morning. Maybe we need um, an activity in this spot. What can I do different? Yeah, it's very interesting. you know, And it's a great way to look at it because you're always evolving. You're always expanding. You're always learning. Even though you're an expert in your field, you're always willing to take that next step and go above and beyond and accept people's because some somebody in the audience might have a phenomenal idea yeah. for your next for your next conference. That's that's where most of my material comes from. I'm constantly quoting things I've seen or things that people have told me. And I, you know, I mean there's certain stories that I will probably tell until the day I die as long as I'm doing a presentation. And everything about that presentation or my writing I wanted to you know if I if you look at what I wrote in 2010 and compare it to what I wrote in 1982 I would like to think that you're going to see a difference that you're going to see growth there and mm-hmm. it doesn't mean that I was a bad person in 1982 I just didn't have the experience the feedback or god bless them the editorial assistance and feedback that I've gotten over 30 years as a writer so um it's all it's all part of the process it's all part of the process. And having a bad idea or an idea that doesn't work here doesn't mean that it's a bad idea or an idea that won't work over here. In, or in a, in a different time. Maybe it's in not a, ready, exactly. like you said. Yeah. Or with a different voice. I remember submitting the first couple chapters of the original um, edition of uh, 21st Century Discipline when I was working on that. And I was seeing so much stuff. And I mean, I, listen, it's very hard to be an educator and not let the negativity... Um, really kind of grind you down, especially after 40 years. This is my 40th year in the business. So, um, and I've seen things just, I, I feel like we're moving backwards um, in so many ways. And so sometimes it gets to me and it shows up. And I had written this really kind of depressing voice, you know, and I'd just written in this very depressing voice with this, you know, I had submitted the first couple chapters. And, you know, my editor said, you know, this is a great start. This is a great start. Now let's kind of turn the tone around a little bit. And it basically meant, you know, scrapping that start, starting from scratch in a very different frame of mind. So sometimes it's just an exercise in, um, you know, sort of like stretching before you work out. Um, Yes. You know, sometimes you just write crap. And that's what it is. It's just crap. But it doesn't mean you're crap. It just means that that's part of the process of getting to the good stuff. (laughs) 